All right, hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, perhaps wherever you're calling from. My name is Ginny Barber. I'm the uh, Director of Open Access Australasia. Uh, welcome to this, um, this webinar for Open Access Week. Um, it's the last day of the week and we've had a very productive and very um, um, kind of lively and really thought provoking set of sessions and I'm really looking forward to this session today. Um, just a few logistics as usual. Um, we will record this session and share it on our website with the CC BY license. Uh, please, if you could, keep your microphone muted and your camera turned off, obviously, unless you're speaking um, uh, on our panel. Uh, please do type your chest questions into the chat. We love having conversations there. We've had some very lively ones there. Uh, and in the interest of everyone's time, we will finish on time. So it's my delight to hand over to Lukman Hayes, who is a member of our organising committee from AUT, um, to chair this next session. Kia ora, Ginny. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Lukman Hayes toko ingoa. Um, and I'm joining you today um, from stolen land in Aotearoa, Tamaki Makoto, where Ngāti Whātua o ki Orake, uh, Tainui, Ngāti Paua, are uh, the mana whenua, or custodians, among other iwi and hapu. Um, Jenny, if you could put up the slide for the um, acknowledgement of country. So just as, uh, some slides I think I need to read out. So Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Open Access Australasia recognises the Awabako, Turabal and Yugara and Bedigal as the First Nations owners of the lands where we work. We also pay our respects to all Indigenous peoples wherever they are in the world, including Nā iwi Māori, uh, the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa. Uh, as uh, Ginny mentioned, we'll be um, recording the session and making it available on the Open Access Australasia website. Um, and now I'm going to so open up the korero today, the discussion uh, with the karakia. Ranganui ki runga, papatuānuku ki raru. Ka puta te ira tangata, e te whei ao. Ki te ao marama, tu turu fakamawa, ki a tina, ina, homie puie dai, dai ki. So, um, what I'd like to do now is, is just, um, just before I do actually, what I'll do is, is give you my short me. Um, no Tamaki Makoto Ho, so I'm from Auckland. My ancestors are uh, Jewish people from Georgia in Eastern Europe on my mother's side, and uh, my father's ancestors from Ireland. My own whanau uh, arrived as settler colonials in 1968, and the last of the assisted passage ships to sail from England. I work as a scholarly communications team leader at uh, Te Wananga or Aranui or Tamaki Makoto, also known as AUT. I'd like now to invite each of our panelists to um, introduce themselves uh, and speak their own mihi. Um, and I've done this in, in alphabetical order, so I'll ask you India first. Yeah, kia ora tātou. Um, thank you so much for coming to, together to share space with um, everyone here present today. Um, ko e o, ahi mokupono o ngā tikanganu a rongo mai wahine rangitāne. Um, so I come from the East Coast. Um, my dad's family is from England and Ireland. My mum's family is from Kanganu, uh, Norway and Scotland. Um, so a good old blend um, of Māori and miscellaneous European. 
Um, and yeah, I have a background actually in, in archaeology and um, museum work. So as my first mahi out of high school was um, working at my local museum in the Māori department. Um, and then, yeah, got distracted by climate change um, and the impacts of that, that that was having on my community. And so now um, I do mahi with Te Arafatu, which is a network of Indigenous youth, uh, predominantly Māori and Pacifica, working on the climate justice space in Aotearoa. Um, and then I'm also the climate justice organiser at Action Station, um, which is a campaigning organisation that campaigns across um, economic fairness, um, te tiriti justice and climate justice. So um, a whole range of things and yeah, kind of a jack of all trades. Um, anything from blockades through to UN advocacy and lobbying. Um, but yeah, just jump in wherever the mahi is needed basically is kind of how I do my work. Um, yeah, that's me. I'll, I'll pass over to you, Dion. Yep, yeah, Malo Lava Le Soi Fue Lang Ma. My name is Dr. Le Fawali I Dion Enari. Uh, I'm uh, born of two Samoan parents, born in New Zealand, uh, raised in Australia, and having also worked uh, in my ancestral homeland of Samoa. Uh, my master's was in politics and my PhD was on the practice and the perceptions of the Samoan culture held by the Australian community. So how I, <laughs> a lot of my research has to do with the decolonization and indigenization of all different spheres. And I am currently a lecturer at the School of Sport and Rec uh, at AET where I'm currently trying to decolonize and indigenize that space as much as possible. Um, my my tie-in with uh, climate change is um, as a researcher, so much of my uh, publications have to do with um, publishing on climate change and giving voice to Pacific and, and Maori and, and Indigenous uh, practitioners and advocates and, and warriors in this space so then we're not silenced and we're not just looked at as um, the, the person being researched, yeah, or the community being researched, much rather us being the, the main storytellers of our narratives as it pertains to climate change. So yeah, I'm really excited to share space here today. Kia ora, and I'll pass it along to my cousin, Lisa. Thanks, Dion. Tyler for lava. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Viliamo Jameson. I'm a Tama'i Ta'i Samoa, meaning Samoan woman. Um, and my family villages are Sapapali'i, Satalo, and Lalumanu. I'm currently based in Niue. So um, my small family and I have been here for five weeks. Uh, we brought our, my young son, who's just six months old, um, to plant his placenta here and, and do things that we need to for his ceremonies. I'm usually based in Mianjin, uh, which is Brisbane. And my background is I started in the Brisbane community as a um, as a organizer, uh, working with the Pacifica diaspora and mobilizing community um, through the Pacific Climate Warriors. Uh, and so I spent a few years doing that, um, doing illegal sit-ins, lobbying, protests, holding the fossil fuel industry accountable. My work more recently is that I uh, do a lot of solidarity work with the Torres Strait. So um, most recently being a campaigner for the climate justice case, Our Islands, Our Home. Uh, and yeah, really uh, working with communities up there who are on the front lines of climate change and ensuring that their stories are amplified. Um, whilst I, my own ho ancestral homelands are impacted by climate change, um, I have a role and a responsibility um, in Brisbane to show solidarity with the First Nations people there. And that's me, thank you. Hello everyone, I think I'm next. I am Tilakshi, I'm a PhD researcher from Western Sydney University. I'm also an international student from Sri Lanka living in Nanawa country, Canberra. Um, I pay my respect uh, to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that First Nations people, um, I acknowledge that the sovereignty of the land was never ceded 
always was, always will be Aboriginal land. The consequences of colonial violence and ongoing settler colonialism are the foundation of inequality and injustice. And I support all those who resist. Uh, my transdisciplinary research examines social media, public libraries, and civic action with a particular focus on the experiences of refugee and asylum seeking women. As a student curriculum partner at Western Sydney University, I work in partnership with staff, students, and community-based organizations, co-creating decolonized knowledges about social action and climate action. As my PhD topic also suggests, I'm rather passionate about co-creating spaces for missing voices. And uh, I thank the organizers for having me to here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'm just going to um, present a few questions to our panel um, and uh, you're encouraged to add your questions to the chat. Uh, you're also encouraged to tweet if that is your thing, despite the recent news that it's likely to be taken over by a certain person. And there are a couple of hashtags you might want to chuck in there like OA Week and Open for Climate Justice. Um, and to get to our first question, uh, could I just get each of you to um, start by talk, telling us about um, the climate justice campaigns and actions that you've been personally involved with and why they are so important? You know, what sort of audiences are you trying to reach and what, what change would you like to see? Um, what, could I start with you, Tulakshi? I'll work backwards to the after. Oh yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, for over two years, I have been working as a student curriculum partner uh, for a university-wide curriculum transformation project called 21C. And uh, amidst the pandemic and bushfires and floods, I have been co-creating transdisciplinary undergraduate curriculum focused on climate justice with two other uh, staff members. Doc I have to name them today, actually, Dr. Jenna Condi and Dr. James Gawley. Uh, students as well as external partners such as Australian Youth Climate Coalition. So having designed this curriculum that we really care about this year, 2022 July, we decided to have one day event at the university where students and staff can get together to talk about climate justice and social action. I will actually add the link to the video we created on the uh, event in the chat. So we called this the Festival of Action. The intention was to reiterate how the university can be an activist space, uh, proactively promoting conversations that future generations should be a part of. And this was an opportunity to initiate quote unquote radical conversations such as decolonizing climate justice knowledge, for example, talking more about the inclusion of knowledges of indigenous communities and in, you know, Asian communities. So now we take this festival of action even beyond the walls of the university to talk to people with diverse and rich experiences um, with climate justice. So in September 2022, we took it to a conference called Power Shift organized by the, uh, by the Australian Youth Coalition to talk to youth about advocating for climate justice. So my contribution to climate justice is through curriculum co-creation and my team, as I mentioned, we take an event-based approach to reach the communities and spread the word about climate justice. Yeah. Awesome. Lisa, would you like to go? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I work with the um, Pacific Island diaspora. Um, so over the years, I've been an organiser with the Pacific Climate Warriors um, in Brisbane, and we've done a range of different um, tactics and mobilising community, um, particularly in the lead up to federal elections, um, lobbying, um, putting pressure on the government, but also um, whilst we might not be on the front lines of climate change um, in Mianjin, we're on the front lines of climate action there. So um, taking part in civil disobedience, um, you know, uh, trying to stop coal mines and fracking on country. Um, so we've done that through um, empowering the youth there and um, through storytelling and creative ways of merging culture and, and the arts and activism. So uh, just like a really brief example recently, 
um, we're just about to launch some climate change earrings um, by this designer. Um, but these aren't the ones, uh, but it's just a creative way of like getting our messaging out there um, as well as, you know, uh, you know, getting on, on radio and doing everything we can to amplify what's happening in the Pacific. On the other spectrum, I work with the Torres Strait traditional um, owners who recently won a landmark case uh, with the UN Human Rights Committee. Um, so eight traditional owners took the Australian federal um, government to the United Nations over human rights abuses uh, regarding climate inaction. And they won their case and it sets a precedent for climate vulnerable people, vulnerable people worldwide. So uh, my role is behind the scenes, um, you know, uh, sharing and amplifying those stories and connecting them to the right people, including media, um, and just making sure that Indigenous people don't have to deal with, you know, um, the stuff I've had to deal with in the past, <laughs> trying to block things and also act as a bridge. Uh, and I'll pass to Dion. Yeah, I love it. Thank you very much. So my uh, involvement in the climate change space really has to do as a writer and uh, an academic using my um, position in academia to then um, amplify and to privilege and to center all the awesome initiatives that are happening on the grassroots. So one of my publications that I've done with Lisa is here. Um, so yeah, basically a lot of my work has to do with um, looking at all this awesome stuff all these indigenous communities are doing and then putting them in the academic round via um, academic publication so then we can then attack in that space so yeah and 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 it's been really fun so I've I've published um, work on climate change with Lisa I've done some work with other climate change activists in Europe and just really um and a lot of my work also has to do with reimagining uh, different ways and in, in using our Indigenous knowledge systems and our Indigenous will, uh, wisdom to address these climate change issues that are occurring right now. Yep. Hold on, and I'll pass it along <laughs> to India. Shout out to um, Yeah, firstly, just want to shout out as well to the Torres Strait 8. I think it was just like such an incredible win and I'm really stoked what it, about that because of what it means for communities like mine as well that are facing the impacts of climate change as well. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm a bit of like a behind the scenes gremlin sometimes, bit of a speak to the media sometimes, like running around doing the organizer thing. So sometimes that means like writing the agendas and posting the Zoom links. And sometimes it means like coordinating advocacy or responding to media questions during a big political moment. Um, but yeah, so that comes up in a mix of things, whether that be trying to get Indigenous rights language um, in the Paris Agreement or um, trying to support um, getting reparations for loss and damage by the impacts of climate change. Um, just to note that for the upcoming climate talks as well in the UN space, that hopefully there will be a win there in terms of getting those reparations. Um, but more recently, I guess in terms of the organization that we work at, um, we bring kind of like the campaign machine and partner with expert organizations or academics or researchers to kind of take through political power and to bring political power to what they're trying to achieve. So um, what that looks like in terms of our climate team is um, going hyper local and We've partnered with a local Māori nation, Ngāti Tōa, which is down in, in Purirua and in the um, Wellington region in Aotearoa, um, and hired one of their young people as a climate justice campaigner. And then we're working together to try and develop alternative waste infrastructure um, because currently the waste treatment plant in Purirua um, regularly discharges raw waste straight into the harbour. It has... Um, yeah, it's just been consent, reconsented to be allowed to do that. And during times of big rainfall, which is happening increasingly, um, the pipes are starting to spill sewage onto streets and that kind of thing. And of course, the overlap there is that it was built on top of a sacred site. Um, and there isn't a petition yet. <laughs> We're just figuring it out. We just had our big election campaign to try and get good people into council who then get to decide what happens with the waste treatment plant. So because um, we don't usually talk about poo 
as like a climate issue. Um, that's a lot of what we're doing. Um, it means that we are working with the local community to, to develop a Māori set of rules for how we process bio waste. You know, can that be put on gut food gardens? Can that be put on reforesting areas? Um, what do we do with that? Because there's a bunch of it's like Māori approaches to waste that are really important to um, be based from. Um, and then hopefully that means if we can get that funded and, and pilot infrastructure funded, um, that we can then make the waste treatment plant um, irrelevant um, because it's also poisoning the harbour in such a way that um, it really limits the capacity of um, local people to be able to gather their food because it was the food basket back in the day before colonisation. And so we're hoping to bring that back, which would then help with food miles and that kind of thing as well and so it's just really awesome to be going super local and partnering with the local community to um, resolve something that's right in their backyard that they've been having to grapple with for decades and that the local council has repeatedly ignored them about so um, yeah that's what we're working on right now and yeah I'll share an update if when I can um, but yeah that's me. Kia ora. and actually I'm going to stay with you India. <laughs> I warned you about this. <laughs> no, um, because you did talk about um, working with researchers in particular, and um, while I'm going to ask you to respond to this question, um, with the, any of the questions that follow, any of you feel free to just jump in and, you know, just keep the conversation uh, however you want. Um, yeah, like thinking about the kind of research that goes into the actions that you are part of and participate in and building the awareness, um, and uh, Dion talked about the research that he's done and published. Um, I'm interested to know the extent to which you find any of that work curtailed by paywalls or other types of barriers. Um, and do you find it difficult to, to sort of share some of that important research with, with the people involved and, and movements that you're connected to? Um, and that, you know, does that put barriers where you're trying to build campaigns and, and build you know, force around lobbying and change. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's like tangled into a, a bigger thing around how like universities and, and researchers operate, which is, you know, and this is something that goes back hundreds of years that we are the people that are researched and then that knowledge goes somewhere else or our our tonga, our treasured items, our cultural artifacts are taken somewhere else and held for other people to look at, um, but for us to no longer have autonomy over. And I, I think that autonomy, that self-governance over knowledge is an important theme to maintain um, because even we will have researchers, like I get research interview requests weekly to talk about climate work, but there's never anything in that query about whether how that's going to um, benefit my own community rather than going to someone's PhD that then helps them get qualified and then I never see or hear from them again um, and we never get any access to any resources for taking the time to answer those questions and that kind of thing and also really understanding and holding the like research is not where the money is necessarily <laughs> depending on what you're researching but I, I think it is really important that we acknowledge the patterns of extraction that not only occur on our lands but also with our knowledge as well and so I think then when it comes to, say, being able to share research with our own communities, um, it's hard, yeah, when there is a paywall. And it's even harder when there's no accountability there with the reach researcher themselves to continue to distribute and share that knowledge with our communities in a way that's accessible. And we do, like, so I've been involved with um, a space called the Indigenous Peoples Platform um, in the UN. And it's space, it's where Indigenous communities can come together to share knowledge. And they wanted to make a website where we could share this knowledge. And actually we had to say, no, like these are private spaces for us to share amongst ourselves. We don't want a piece of our knowledge going somewhere that then loses its potency because it's taken out of our cultural systems of knowledge and our whole worldviews. And then is used for some other thing somewhere else that we don't have relationship to. And it's, it's that relationship piece that's, really, really important. And I do want to share um, something that we did that was really awesome. It was actually before I started working at the organization at Action Station, but um, they partnered with the public health um, department at Otago University to write the people's report on the justice system. 
So they worked with these students who are studying public health, they worked with public health lecturers um, to not only research this because the students had to create a research project and write an output to be able to get you know, their credits, but they um, also worked with our organization to compile people's lived experiences of the justice system and their recommendations and then publicly launch that to the community with a list of asks attached to it. So that it's that thing of how do we gear research towards being of use to the communities that are most affected and making sure there's as little barriers as possible, but also making sure that there's accountability there and in case you know something goes wrong or in case there's a misstep and then we can call each, each other in and correct that. Um, I know Dion, you had some thoughts about this as well. Um, yeah, this is a very big um, corridor. Basically, um, in a nutshell, if you're doing research on the community that is not beneficial of the community and the community does not want, you are raping and pillaging that community. It is that simple. Yeah, um, it's really important to, um, in, you know, and I've seen the Mao practice just the whole machinery of research on Indigenous people in the past and to this day is extremely exploitative in nature. Another, um, another important point that I would also like to make as well um, that isn't really reiterated enough is you don't get your research on the Pacific without the Pacific people and our lands. And so it's very, and so just acknowledging that, um, and, and, and so your research can't be done without our people and without our lands, yet a, a lot of researchers come, they take, and then they charge us, <laughs> the irony, they charge us to read what we gave them. <laughs> so really, so really, it's really important to really check yourself. Another important thing too, you know, and the godmother of doing this is the late uh, Margaret Mead, is to ensure that you do not use us as your blank canvas to impose whatever ideology uh, that you want and, and using us as merely the guinea pigs, which um, which still very much occurs today. So it's very, and, you know, even United Nations organizations are guilty of doing this different, it, it still blows my mind this occurs today, where um, a lot of these different organizations, it's almost, it's that effect of, um, you're not poor until I tell you you're poor concept. So another, this is a very, um, this is a very deep systemic problem. So another problem that we get is a lot of outsider researchers coming to indigenous communities and imposing what they think on these communities, calling these, you know, asking them, how does it feel to be poor or, you know, be socially, disadvantage well did you even bother to ask them if they, you know just a lot of the colonial ignorance um and and again the, the whitewashing of our voices and and our narratives still occurs today so i just um you know it, this is a really important discussion to have i really um would just you know ask everyone here with the different positions you have and the different power that you have to please speak out against this um Another Maori academic, Dr. Sarah Kyung, she said it best um, in terms of allyship, we, we need you to hold the space for us, but we don't need you to fill it. We can fill the space. We need the space held, yeah. But we, we are more than capable to fill these spaces um, and, and express our own narratives. So yeah, in terms of the different paywalls uh, that occur, it's a very, very, very serious issue because again, you got the research from us. <laughs> then you're asking us to, to we, we gifted you this knowledge and then you're, you're, you're charging us at, at big rates to access this. And, you know, a lot of different, and, and another part, and so this goes to data sovereignty. So actually it should be made accessible to all in the community, first and foremost, that's a no brainer. Uh, not only should it be made accessible for all in community, the whole community should be able to approve whether that gets published or not. Um, the other, <laughs> so there, there, there's many, there, there, there's so many issues that, that come on this. And to, and to also, again, I, 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 you know, I beg and plead and please go back and tell your people and your organizations, if your research is not what the community wants and, does, and, and is not given back as a gift to the community to enact real life change, you are exploiting us 
point blank period. So just, yeah, <laughs> just the, the and And now there's a lot more um, indigenous researchers like me who are not afraid to call it out. So I, again, I, I ask that you advocate um, for data sovereignty issues in the spaces that you hold. Uh, Tirachi or Lisa, would you like to jump in on this point or should we, I'm happy to move on to my next. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, India and Dion covered so much ground and <laughs> it's pretty amazing, but feel free. I think they nailed it. <laughs> they covered most of the things, yeah. Do you know why? But perhaps uh, um, the two of you uh, would like to sort of explore a little bit more um, around the whole question of whose voices are missing uh, in the discourse around uh, climate justice in particular. Um, you know, and what, can, what can we do to address sort of issues of inaccessibility and lack of visibility of those voices? Do you want me to start, Lisa? Yeah, go okay. yep. for it. So um, as I mentioned before, I am passionate about uh, the missing voices in these discourses about climate action and um, social action. So as we all know, this is not something new, marginalized voices, especially those that intersect with other domains such as gender, race, class, disability. These are missing conversations. These, these people are missing in vital conversations. So um, I have a South Asian background and a lot of examples that I give would be from that because I'm very new to Australia. And um, so I am from a third world country. And in my life, I have been told a plenty of times that these conversations about climate justice should be reserved for the privileged, that it's a luxury uh, to talk about it when you have so many other unfortunate things going on, like you're fighting for food, you're fighting for shelter. So um, I. I genuinely believe that marginalized communities are also conditioned to believe that they uh, do not belong to these conversations. Um, so uh, now that I'm a PhD researcher and I am a curriculum developer, when I act proactively engage in these conversations about decolonizing knowledge um, that would otherwise produce patriarchy, white supremacy, and uh, settler colonialism, um, I recognize that I have a role to play here against what I've been told when I was growing up. So um, everyone has a role to play in the climate justice movement, whether you are uh, marginalized or not, privileged or not, whether you are fighting for food, shelter or power, you cannot be excluded from these conversations because we just have one earth to live in. And um, so it is about breaking those cross-generational misconceptions about tackling climate justice as well. You need to empower the communities to believe in themselves. Um, education is a tool for breaking these patterns, specifically to address issues of inaccessibility and uh, of the lack of visibility of voices um, in this space of climate justice, researchers and research institutions have a big role to play. So um, I research public libraries and these are known as trusted spaces in marginalized communities. So these are physical public libraries are known to have an ear to the ground where they know what's going on in the communities and all that. But I definitely cannot say the same about most of the digital libraries or the re digital research sites. Um, so this another story again. So I remember 15 year old myself when I was 15 year old uh, in Sri Lanka, I was sitting for my HSA examination and I wanted to read outside my textbook and what my teachers taught me. But I had to wait till I went to university to access those papers because they were way too expensive for me. So um, what I'm trying to say here that these publishers and research institutions have a big role to play in terms of democratization of access to knowledge. So um, it actually shouldn't be Tilakshi who is here in this panel because she went to university. It sh should ideally be Tilakshi is here because she read this paper as a 15 year old. Yeah, so that's, that's my take on it. Did you want to add anything to that, Lisa? Um, not really. I, I guess for me, like I never, I never even considered academia like for 
to help me in terms of climate action and in terms of my my own purpose in in pressuring government or, or stopping the fossil fuel industry I didn't even consider university and how it would benefit um, my grassroots action uh, I did uni because it's you know, my, my, my Samoan mom just was like, you have to do uni. If you don't get your degree, I will die unhappy. So that's why I did it because she saw it as a privilege and, and I did it for her, but it wasn't until Dion was annoying me and saying, you need to publish, you need to publish Lisa. And I was like, why? Like, I don't, I don't understand why I need to. And I, I've never cause like read journal articles that have like informed the way that I, I strategize and campaign. And I've, you know, I feel proud of the work that I've done without it. So um, Dion did encourage me and I, and I, and I did it between all the things that, you know, being a, a mom and all these type of things. So to me, um, yeah, I, I just, I'm not sure if it benefits our communities like that. I, I'm trying to think like, should I do a PhD? But like, will it benefit? Uh, the reason I decided to do to publish with Dion was because I actually researched some of the campaigns I'm involved in and, and noticed people were referencing my work <laughs> and the people, the traditional owners that I work with, and they weren't getting the credit, um, you know, and it was building academic careers. And um, a lot of my job day to day is fundraising to make sure we can get like um, finances to, yeah. oops, sorry, baby just burned. <laughs> to people who need it to be able to share their stories from the front lines and and then I hear about oh you know Dion saying there's so much money in research Lisa did you know I had no idea I had no idea and in all honesty when I've um, been a part of mass mobilizations taken to the streets um, when I've seen people blockade bridges with their bodies and and chain themselves to to coal trains like I don't think they're thinking about my article <laughs> uh, with Dion and and um, but I do think that it acts as a roadmap and as a tool and a compass for for people who aren't from my community to be able to hear our stories and hear um, the complexities and 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 understand the narrative that we want to share, which is of resilience. So that's the only reason why I've um, invested into this. So I hope it can, you guys can prove me wrong. Um, Sorry for the tangent there, Lickman. <laughs> no, that's absolutely not a tangent. It's, it, I think it ties directly into the whole, the whole uh, conversation. And I think this is something I've been reflecting on all week, really, with uh, the discussions about open access and all of that, all of that, that encompasses, because it seems to me the conversations around open access are always dominated by publishers and academia how we assess research, how we value research and how it's disseminated, who gets to read it, so on and so on and so on. And so what I really want to, I guess, what I would love to sort of uh, find out more about is what would a, an Indigenous led, um, for want of a better phrase, scholarly publishing or, um, you know, knowledge system or, you know, open sharing system around those stories that you talk of, what would that look like? because all the time that we're talking, we're still working within the framework of uh, Western academia, of, of those paradigms that you talked about at the beginning. Who wants to jump in on that one? <laughs> I'll just start quickly jumping in as probably, I think the only person on the panel who hasn't actually graduated uni. Um, my degree got put on a shelf um, because of climate change. Um, but I think, there's something there where it's even, I guess, for me, the, the beauty of our communities and the context of being able to tackle climate change is that often our knowledge is collectively held um, and that it is, you know, it is communicated in ways that go beyond an institution. And so there's a resiliency to that knowledge. It's how knowledge managed to survive colonization, that the pieces that we have managed to carry across. And so that's where I guess, and in terms of how we would access knowledge pre-colonization, we did have whare wānanga, we did have learning schools, but they weren't kept to a calendar where you had to do an exam at a certain date. You would go and you'd spend time with the experts and then eventually they'd be like, okay, you've done it. 
here's the new skill that we want you to learn or here's the new piece of knowledge. And so it was very much at the rhythm of the person and it was very much based on the relationship between the expert and the apprentice. And it's that relationality that's really important and that's where trust comes in. I think when it, it comes to even the idea of allowing other people to have access to you know, certain portions of knowledge within my community, there are some things that are absolutely untouchable, non-shareable. Um, but I think that's also then where it comes back to our autonomy, where it's ultimately because our knowledge has been tried and tested over thousands of generations across journeying through the Pacific, um, that our, our knowledge is like really applicable and really practical, as well as having the kind of bigger world pieces to it. And so it's that piece where it's like, why is this necessary to research what is the research in terms of the western model here to prove and actually what would be proven and has been proven over generations through practice that can simply be allowed by self-governance and Māori leadership and Māori guardianship and self-determination I think that's like so often our knowledge has to be defended and validated where it's like actually that comes from a place of deep racism um, we don't have to prove ourselves because actually we've made it through thousands of generations um, in the field um, and so it's yeah we can just trust Māori to lead and we can just let that self-determination that overall decision making be allowed to be done by Māori and remove the power barriers in place and then maybe there can be knowledge sharing along the way um, based on high trust relationships and there's definitely a lot of healing that needs to be done, you know, even in my own academic background in, in archaeology and anthropology, there's so much healing that needs to be done from the impact of the anthropology discipline. Um, and that will have to be a knowledge along the way. It's, it's part of what I guess like ancestral responsibility is, is like even academically, if you're inheriting a discipline that has done harm, that that will just have to be walked with and held with. Um, and it will hurt the hearts along the way. Um, but ultimately, that's what helps us build community and do the healing that then will allow us all to take better action on climate change. It's a bit of a ramble. Um, there's probably people who actually work in research that uh, would be better qualified to answer this question. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I just want to jump in on that. Um, you're absolutely right, and I specifically want to um, visit the power shift. A complete, yeah, if we're going to do this the Indigenous way, then the, the simple answer is us leading it and leading everything um, from the beginning stage of research to when the research is conducted to dissemination and having our own leaders lead the research and what our own leaders lead the research looks like. And, um, you know, this is in terms of the power shift. Um, if you are an expert in a certain field and you have such a passion, you know, you, 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 and you, even if you have a good heart to um, say tackle diabetes in, in some indigenous uh, community, if they say no, it's a no. Yeah. So this, this is, this is a massive, when, when we talk about the power shift, it's a complete power shift of you, not as the researcher who's going to get output, but you as the researcher being a servant to our communities and using your research to serve our communities and being led by our communities from the beginning to the end. And you as the researcher being dictated how you will do the research within our community. So that's the true, that's the real indigenous way. And a lot of, you know, coming from a Samoan point of view, that's how we do things. When we go to a different community, we, we do not have any agenda. We are fully guided by the mana whenua, by, by the, the village or the communities or the families that we are working with in and how we, um, in and how we, we do our research. It's interesting, uh, an, an example of imposed, um, in, imposition by research has gone wrong is I remember in Fiji, uh, the, at the University of South Pacific in Fiji, uh, a funding donor only gave money to this university, uh, to USP, if they were gonna keep doing um, climate change uh, productions. And they said, yep, so we're, we're only gonna give you money um, if you do a production on how climate change is the main issue. They didn't bother to ask the university or the community what their main issue was. They imposed that climate change was their main issue. So again, just ensuring that from the very start, 
you you are a servant serving from the back and you are being led and you 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 are being guided fully by um indigenous leaders and indigenous communities only then is is the research truly with our communities and for our people it's when our own people lead it and and lead all the conditions of how it's done yeah kia ora. Kia ora. Um, so I think for my last sort of question, um, I was going to ask you, Dion, to, to continue. Um, and that was to sort of explore uh, what are Indigenous, especially Māori and Pasifika, ways of addressing climate change. We, we actually heard some excellent presentations early in the week about some of these things, some of the projects going on in Pacific Islands in particular. But perhaps you could talk about that yeah in essence you know the the breakdown of this whole debacle is our knowledge systems have been as indigenous people have been trivialized to myths and legends and western knowledge systems have been uh imposed as the truth so everything can span off that so when we're looking at indigenous ways of addressing uh quite you know climate issues or any issues in general it goes back to um drawing upon our songs drawing upon our haka, the words of the songs our deep oratory uh to to lead to lead the different initiatives that are that are occurring so you know when 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 we look at the hawaiians and even you know different Ma and even certain villages in samoa when we call the motherland our motherland we literally mean she's our mother she's literally our mother we our concept of of land is totally different to the Western concept. So just again, centering our ways of being and knowing and seeing how, how we worship the land. And you know, she, she really is our mother and we we are her offspring, we come off her. And and yeah, and again, to me, you know, when I'm looking at practical ways of doing it, the main practical way again is letting our leaders lead. Letting our leaders lead all these different research that pertains to us. From there, you then get all the different indigenous, iwi specific, village specific ways of addressing different issues such as climate change. Yeah. So I suppose this is an opportunity for um, any of our panelists to, to contribute anything else they wanted to, to bring up. Um, we've kind of covered all of our, the questions we, we looked at together previously. Um, we have a little bit more time um, with the particular topics that you'd like to raise or uh, parts of this discussion you feel are still missing and, and worth bringing. Um, I might just add, when we talk about the climate crisis, like if it just simply comes down to land back. Um, you know, if you listen to traditional owners, to people like, if we just listen to these people who are trying to protect their islands or their homes from extractive industries, you'll see that it, it solves the, pro the problem of climate change. Um, so I think it's just like Dion was saying, just like honouring the relationship that these people, Indigenous people, have with their own lands. And I also like, you know, often in academia I hear, I hear you know, and I say it too, like decolonizing. What does that mean? Like, are we talking about land back? Because that, to me, I feel like um, there needs to be a real emphasis on not just adaptation strategies and and like theorizing things about climate change, but really getting down to the the core of it, which is honoring those voices who are trying to protect those lands. With, there's still gas fracking happening in 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 Australia. There's still coal mines being approved like every day. So. Um, and if if those people were listened to, then yeah, we wouldn't be in this situation. That's my two cents. Thanks, everyone. I think just to quickly add on to that, I mean, you know, people research from different spaces. I know like particularly in Aotearoa, um, there are certain disciplines which are largely commercialized rather than research funded. Um, but I will just say, like, particularly if you work in a university, like, what is the land that is meant to be given back? 
Um, I was asked a really odd question when I was at Stanford recently for a lecture and they were like, oh, what do you think about us sitting like an indigenous knowledge faculty? And I was like, I don't want to be invited here until you've healed your relationship with the indigenous people of this land. And like Stanford, it was like, it was built from the money of this guy who built the railway across Turtle Island into the West, like this big money from big legacy colonizing. And so, you know, I think about even the fact that Auckland University is built on a pa site, on a Māori site, but what was then turned into the military barracks that then housed the military for the big expansion invasions into the rest of Aotearoa. And there's legacies there of inheritance that our universities haven't even begun to think about like reconciling. And then I will say for those of us who are in Aotearoa and Australia, even the US and Canada, there are ways in which our countries that cooperate really effectively to continue to maintain a presence in the Pacific that they do not deserve. Um, and the ways in which like, you know, Australia is about to get nuclear submarines off the UK to be able to like hoon around in the Pacific and mine and stuff. And they, they do not, they should not be there. Even like um, the presence of international waters erases our whakapapa. And so we can talk about research, but it's also like, how are we just going all in on dismantling empire? Because the Pacific, like, is born of love, right? It was, in my stories, it was born of the separation between Sky Father and Earth Mother, so Ranginui and Papatunuku, and, and he wept for her in that separation and made the Pacific. It's a beautiful place of so much vibrancy and aroha that, yeah, just is so much more great and more powerful than than those empires and so there's there's always there's always like a next level that activism can do, go to and I don't want to be like saying burn yourself out on this but I think it's also being very targeted about ways in which we're actually dismantling power rather than doing something that like looks nice and has Māori words on it um you're the big picture thinking that's so easy to do yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so just looking at the chat, there's a, there's a whole lot of um, very positive, supportive comments from a lot of people who are on this call. Um, so Naim Mahi for that. Um, we had one question from somewhere, someone asking whether there was a petition, India, for one of the actions you were talking about. I can't remember which one now. Your yeah, the petition's coming. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, M was talking about uh, incorporating better attribution for um, country and iwi uh, into records, publishing records and, and metadata where, where we store um, or make open our uh, published outputs. Um, Jenny asked a really interesting question, which was, um, you've all suggested some very specific actions for researchers. For those that work in publishing, what else can they do or can we do? I, yeah, I can answer that question. Um, A, ensure that it's published in the language as well. That's really, really important. Yeah, so if you're doing this in my country of Samoa, I also expect the research output to be published in my language, Ninganana Samoa, that's one. Two as well is um so once and you know I and I, I practice this too and it's it's somewhat fulfilling you know we have a responsibility as trans as researchers to then not only translate it into the actual languages of the different communities that we work with but then also translate it in a way that can you know a user friendly way for everyday people to um understand as well so you know whether it's going um. Another thing that I, I normally practice is once I publish an academic article, I then normally write a news article on it. So then I'll normally then put it on a newspaper just to add, you know, it just so then everyone's informed of the, all different audiences are, are informed of the research that I do and that the research that I do may be up for discussion and critique, which it should be, yeah. Um, and, and that, so, so then basically, as, as the researcher when we're publishing, just trying to find different ways to disseminate the information um, to hit 
the communities that you worked with, but then to also hit um, powerful people who can help the cause as well. Yeah, that's my answer to it, if anyone else has, yeah. And perhaps, you know, other formats as well, such as, you know, recordings and video, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the written article all of the time. Um, again, that goes back to the whole thing that academia is obsessed with, the written object. Um, I would also add one point that um, I, I think I firmly believe in partnerships. So um, the approach, what the approach that the research publishers take should not be just like a commercial approach to um, just give and take, but how do they themselves, not just researchers, but they themselves fund partnerships with communities, with researchers and all that is vital. They are just not a money-making uh, publishing machines. So uh, that approach to their work is very, very important, I believe. That's just one small thing I want to add. Yes, absolutely. I mean, um, if it were down to me, there would be absolutely no money involved in academia at all. <laughs> and I'm sure some of you, perhaps all of you, have experienced trying to get something published in an open access journal and having to pay an article processing charge, which can be extortionate. and you know, literally extortionate. Um, just a couple more questions. Oh, Lisa, did you want to speak to those points? I you may have oh. be busy with baby over there. <laughs> Sorry, not much to, right. to that. Just that, yeah, our own community has to self-fundraise for scholarships. I'm sure there's money out there and I'm sure researchers know yeah philanthropists and that so you're maybe connecting the right people to each other yeah. would be cool. the um i'm sorry just to add to lisa's point as well um as researchers that go in uh, another important point to make for researchers that go into indigenous communities not only do you have a responsibility to ensure that your research has real life impact and is what the community wanted you also have a responsibility to then grow researchers from that community so you're not there again so and you know i even have that practice as well um in terms of holding space the the, the academic role that i have to then ensure that you know the work that i'm doing with say nati fatua that um, I bring up the next far, Nazi far to a person, so then they're in charge of, of, of that narrative. So just also really ensuring that the communities we work with, that we have a responsibility and that we are then, um, they're, they're, that's when you're truly, truly working the space um, honestly and, and in good intention and that, that you use your privilege, you know, even me using my privilege as an academic to then bring up the next people that come from these communities to then be researchers or hold these, these spaces powerfully because in essence, um, they, are, they are the masterminds, they are the main, they are the true um, experts of the, the, the kid that was born and raised in Nazi Fatu was the true expert of the best thing to do for Nazi Fatu. So just using our, our positions to then, um, to bring up the, the next generation of researchers from those communities, I, I believe is really, really important as well. Kia ora. Kia ora and, and thank, I want to thank all of you um, for all of your time and this incredible discussion we've had today. Um, we had another question in the chat about how someone can um, do more to get involved in the sort of work that you you all do. Um, and I would suggest that um, you follow these people on social media or you look them up. And I was going to say as a thank you from the audience, because our panelists have given up their time for nothing today, that as a koha or as a gift to them, that you support their work, that you you know join the actions that they help to organise, that you sign the petitions, and that you you know start actions of you are of your own because we're living in an extreme age of, of of emergency, one emergency after another, and we have to act instead of simply talk about it. Um, so finally. Um, Thank you again to my panelists um, and to all of the audience today. Uh, and we'll, we'll close off the discussion with a, uh, a closing karakia. Um, Virginia, if you're able to pop the slide up for everybody, that would be great. 
kia whakaria te tapu, kia wātea ai te ara, kia tūruki whakataha ai, kia tūruki whakataha ai. Haumie, huie, dai kia. Tai kia. Thank you all again. Um, be well. Ka, kia kaha, stay strong and um, so long. <laughs>